I hope you've enjoyed the process you've seen on this Cal 40 restoration. We've had a great time here at Berkeley Marine and our project is wrapping up. And we'll show you a few more episodes in the future along with use of the boat as we go into the major events that we're planning to enter. We've decided that we're enjoying this so much and the response has been so good that we'd like to continue on and so we've changed the name of the series to Great Old Boats. If you notice this beauty behind me, this is a Abba King and Rasmussen build S&S design. She's about 60 or 70 years old and she's in great shape overall. They've had a little bit of electrolysis problem back in the rear quarters of this boat and now she's having professional restoration done to those quarters of the boat. We're really looking to find more projects to document the background of the boat, who the designers were, how they were built, and show you what goes into the maintenance and restoration of these boats as they go through their lives. We hope if you have a suggestion on a worthy project that we could document, that you let us know here on our website, Great Old Boats, and we will uh, follow up and see what we can do to do a good job of informing you and all the other viewers that we have about what goes in, what the skills are required, what are the materials that are being used to keep these beauties in the water for another 70 or 80 years. Hopefully this will all be helpful hints that will make it easier for you to repair your boat and encourage you to keep your boat in remarkable condition because who knows, in 60 years your boat could be the classic that someone's trying to restore down the road. I hope you'll contribute some ideas to us and that we uh, have a chance to show you more about what goes on inside this boatyard and with the ownership and the history of these boats. <laughs> okay, it's Friday afternoon, it's five o'clock. It's about two years and five months since we pulled the boat out of the water. I think we've made record time considering everything we've done to this boat, the complete rebuild. Cree's ready, he had a very busy day hauling boats and launching boats. And uh, he's sticking around, we're gonna get this thing in the water tonight. I can't wait. Uh, we may pull it out a couple more times to get the last of the work done on the bottom, but right now we're going to try and get the boat in the water this weekend, do some sea trials with the engine. So, Steve, tell me, other than being the master carpenter here at the boatyard, what brought you into being able to christen boats? With the power vested in me okay. by the Church of Universal Life and also the School of Hard Knocks <laughs> and the and also I'm holding the beer. Okay, you got that. With this beer and many more that will uh, will flow during her tenure, I wish all those who sail on her and you in particular and your family the best of sailing with Sequoia. Great, thank Job you very well much. Done. Awesome. I christen ye Sequoia. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> And that's the boat yard send off. Isn't that beautiful? <laughs>
We didn't know whether the deck was off a little bit, and this is something they'd lived with before, or where the pan was off. We just, we had a lot of looking and back and forth and measuring. So with the help of the tools, we can figure out that our loads are exactly the same, and then we can balance this to, to make sure it's dead center in the boat. We took a scale with the main hired and went to side to side to see if we got the tip in the center. And then after we get the mass in the center, then we take our loose gauge. So that, we, that induces a bend down here, right? That's, yes. And so that gauge works Gages, off of that, okay. And it tells you how much tension we have on the rod. And right here we have 45, and you look on the scale, that puts it the tension of 1,400 pounds. And so now what you'll do is try and tension the other side yes. and make sure that that, and then you do and the uppers up, at the same uppers time. Uppers at the same time, okay. back and forth. So now we've, we've been playing with a little bit this morning. Um, the, the two shrouds are balanced. It turns out the rig is in the center of the boat, which is a great le relief to me. And uh, everything's looking really good. So that was our first step. Now what we're going to be doing is we're going to be working on putting a synthetic backstay on the boat. This is what we're using for the backstay. It's Danima, and it's called STS from New England Ropes. It is strong enough to pick up the boat. I started using synthetic ropes in, during the America's Cup in like the 12 meters. That's 10 feet, uh, 8 inches. We could go, to say, to 11 feet. What do you think, Jay? I'd say 11 feet. The you know, higher you get it, the better advantage you have. Yeah. It's a pretty narrow transom, but the synthetic backstay is uh, a neat way to go because we can actually go inside the weave of the rope and put in a, an antenna wire for an SSB or a single sideband radio. And uh, we're going to be using not hydraulics, but with a, a cascading mechanical system on the back. So it, it's different than a lot of other Cal 40s, but uh, I think it'll be a big improvement to the boat. So this is uh, our friend Mitch. Uh, Mitch has uh, been working on the boat from time to time. He, he got stuck with a lot of the really dirty, gooey jobs where we were taking the boat apart. And I can't think of a more miserable job than grinding off some of the stuff you had to grind off. But uh, Mitch helps us out on a lot of stuff. He works with Jay quite a bit. And today he's doing the high wire act. He's, uh, he's the guy who's going to be going up the mast uh, and getting the backstay set up for us. This is a Tough Luff Aero, which is uh, a newer of our Tough Luff products, and it is a uh, polycarbonate product. The feature of this is it snaps in over the foil. We open this extrusion up a little bit and pry it over the head stack, and it gives us two grooves. The one in the back is our primary, where our jib is attached. But let's say the conditions change. Well, instead of taking one sail down and going bare poles there for a while, we can put another sail up in the second groove, get it fully hoisted, and be ready to fly it when we drop the other sail. So we never lose any way when we're changing sails from one, one smaller jib or larger jib down to another jib. This is a specialty product that's designed for racing. If we were going to do uh, more cruising with the boat, we would put on one of our 2100 jib furling systems, which would allow us to roll the sails up. But as we're trying to keep the boat as light and as aerodynamic as possible, we're using a Tough Luff product uh, to make the boat as sleek and fast as we can make it. In addition to that is the whole process which we'll get into about what's required in order to do the Transpac race. And the Transpac race and the Transpac organizing committee has a very explicit set of rules. Uh, this, some of this is in addition to the ORR requirements for safety gear. And we can run through a list of that a little later, but all the things that we have to provide for this boat for an offshore event. Um, in addition to that, we have to do some training with safety at sea, and we have to have some first aid training. Uh, Cree and I have accomplished the safety at sea training, and that, that was quite humorous. We were down at San Diego Yacht Club, very good program that's run by uh, U.S. Sailing, run in this case, uh, moderated by Bruce Brown and Chuck Hawley. And they, um, they did a great job of bringing in speakers and getting into all the different elements of safety at sea from man overboard retrieval to when to use a life raft, to crash safety, flares, all of this stuff that's really uh, very important when things go wrong at sea. And we're glad we got that certification out of the way. Uh, and in fact, in their two-day hands-on training, we're required to put on our safety gear, jump in the pool, and get in a life raft. 
and that was quite a comedy of watching Cree and I jumping in and trying to get into a dinky little life raft with about six other people. It was sobering to say the least to say that you might have to someday get in it. I'm glad we did the training and never want to have to do it again. So we're going to make sure that the boat is safe and as sound as it can be and that we avoid the situation that would put us in a life raft. But now we've done it, so we have a feeling for where we're going with it. Um, in addition, we have to have uh, first aid CPR training. At least a third of the crew has to do that. And then there's a whole list of other things that we have to have in the way of minimum equipment in order to compete in this event. So we'll be going over that list. It's, uh, it's exciting. It is a management challenge to get this organized and organize a crew. And I'm just uh, I'm really excited about it. I, I think we have enough time to get it all done. We have some inspections that we have to do before the race uh, down in the Long Beach area before the start. And then we have um, all the little domesticated issues that go with it, like provisioning this boat for the food and water that we need to get to Hawaii. So I think when you lay it all out in some sort of a time flow chart or a perk chart and you see all the decisions that have to be made and when the timeline has to be satisfied, you can see it's really an exciting management process for your entire team to get this boat ready to leave and go for 10 or 12 days to the line.